take into account the short amount of time I have, I will only make only present two facts and two main proposals to maybe slightly improve uh, the complex proposal already made. So first, something that will seem quite obvious for many of you, but not for all, a state is not an household. Often said that similarly to an household, a state should not spend more than its revenue. In the case of a state, taxation revenue. But in fact, a state is not an household. It is therefore not expected to manage a budget and debt like one. As a state is eternal, which is not the case of an household, of course, it does not really have to run budget surplus to be able to reimburse its stock of debt. In fact, state don't reimburse. They roll over the stock of debt each time new debt arrive at maturity, they issue a new one. So what really matters for the debt sustainability of a state, it's clearly partly the stock of debt, but it's also the flow of debt, which can be captured for those that know by the growth financing needs. It's mostly two things. First, how much it costs for you as a state to roll over your stock of debt. This is captured by the annual interest payment. And second, how often do you have to roll over your stock of debt? And this is captured by the average maturity of your stock of debt. These two indicators that go beyond debt to GDP allow you to have a different picture of the question of debt stability in Europe. So here you can see on this slide, the annual interest payment, so what we call debt servicing cost, in the EU. As you can see in the 1990s, all the main countries for the EU area were between 3.5 and 11% of GDP. Nowadays, they're somewhere between 0.5 and 4%. So, so this is the cost of rolling over your stock of debt to make it simple. Other part, the average maturity, how often do you have to roll over your stock of debt? We move from three to nine years to seven to 11 years in the euro area. I just wanted to point these two facts to make you understand that the dynamic of a big, big debt is not as a dynamic of an household debt, and that debt to GDP has sometimes to be well, take with some distance, let's say. The second uh, point I want to make is the fact that the current fiscal rules are unable to capture debt sustainability and are, in fact, mostly arbitrary in nature. It's well known that uh, the fiscal limit embedded in the European treaties, so the 60% debt to GDP and 3% deficit, are arbitrary thresholds. They, they are not based on scientific evidence, and basically there is nothing that happened at 61% debt to GDP, 70, 80, 90. It's, and if we have this number, in fact, it's because they are broadly the average of public debt back in the day in 1990s when we decided to establish the Maastricht Treaty. But more fun fundamentally, debt to GDP is not the appropriate indicator to capture debt sustainability. Let me show you uh, an example here. Here you can, say the you can see the government debt to GDP in 2020, so it's a very special year. For many countries, uh, the country in red, country outside of the EU, in blue, inside the EU, and you see the level of 60% debt to GDP, the reference value in the annex uh, to the treaty, uh, the European Treaty. So the big question could be, as you can see, many of these countries are far above 60%, but does it mean that their stock of debt is unsustainable and that there is something to do that they really need to cut their debt? At least it's not the opinion of the financial markets. Here on this slide, what you can see is the credit rating of Japan, United States, France, and Ukraine. As you can see, Japan 256% debt to GDP in 2020, United States 160, that's changed nowadays, France 124, they all have excellent credit rating from the Moody uh, credit rating agency. But Ukraine, and I, I want to say first that these are number from 2020 and also for the credit rating, Ukraine had debt to GDP below 60%, it was around 50, but still the assessment from the financial market from the credit rating agency was that it was maybe not, it was risky to invest in their public debt. What I want you to keep in mind with that is just that um, they are not only debt to GDP, there are other indicators that capture that. And what credit rating agency, in fact, are doing, so we check Finance Watch is mostly composed of former investment banker and the rest, and we check the methodology of all the credit rating agency. And when you take a look into how they analyze uh, the credit worthiness, let's say, of a country, the most important indicator for them is the economy of the country its size, its complexity, its ability to be resilient to shock, um, its uh, growth prospect, 
And then they have other pillars of analysis, among which you have clearly public finance. But in public finance, debt to GDP is one indicator. The other one are the one I showed you before, debt servicing costs, average maturity, and plenty of other. So I want to say you that is because one of the contentious issue about the proposal of the commission is that they suggest to make to allow country to come with country specific debt pathway based on debt sustainability analysis. From the finance watch perspective, we think it's an excellent proposal that's really based on the literature, the most the state of the art knowledge about debt sustainability. And we think it's really something that should be uh, promoted uh, because the debt sustainability analysis, in fact, take all these indicators into account, try to understand the interaction, also apply some shock to them. So it's some sort of stress testing for public finance. And just wanted to start by at least uh, supporting this proposal, which is challenged by some member states at this stage. Now I will come to the, the two points and I will try to be as short as possible. The first point is that ensuring debt sustainability requires not only to look at past a debt dynamic based on past value, it's basically what debt sustainability are doing in general, but also to have a forward-looking approach to future risk. Let's take an, um, an example to make it a bit more clear. Let's take climate-related risk. There is a growing amount of evidence that climate change will affect our economy, that some feedback loop exists between the economy and the financial system, and that all of this will require a different level, different way the, the states to do something and it will, let's say, lead to important costs for public budget. I don't really have the time to go to the different number of this risk, but I, I just want you to know that this notion of the risk of climate change on public budget is called climate-related fiscal risk, and there is uh, an institution that started to assess this risk. What you can see here is the estimation by the Office for Budget Responsibility in the UK of the impact that climate change could have on the UK budget by 2050. They made it and run different uh, scenarios, including different uh, type of change, reform, technologies, and arrived at a conclusion, for example, in the late action scenario, that climate change could lead to as much as plus 45% of debt to GDP by 2050. It's clearly not the only risk facing Europe. I just wanted to put an emphasis on the fact that only looking at debt dynamic in the short run is not enough. We really have to take into account what could happen in the long run. And therefore, we have to do two things. As part of the review, there will be a new mandate for what we call the EU independent fiscal institution. We think, as Finance Watch, but with many other organizations, think tank and civil society organizations as Climate Action Network, that they should be required to, uh, all the independent fiscal institutions at national level should be required to produce this fiscal risk analysis. But just doing analysis is not enough. So second point is the necessity to do precautionary investment to reduce this risk. So continuing on the example of climate change, for the EU to achieve its own environmental objective, it of course needs reform. But not only, it also needs to raise an additional 450 billion per year. So it's between 3 and 4% of EU GDP, the so-called green funding gap that you can see here in the, the estimation by the Commission in 2020. The, the number is a bit higher uh, nowadays with uh, the power EU. And this funding gap has to be bridged by private actors, sure, but also by the public. There is a different role for all of them, and the public can also uh, help to activate some private investment. Um, the public has still uh, to spend more or less among something like 2% of EU GDP. But other um, investment gap exists, as you can see here, public investment gap and many others. I don't really have the time to go in it, but more or less we might have between 3 and 4% of GDP of investment need in Europe nowadays. If state were us all, they would probably have to cut spending to be able to invest and to bridge this funding gap. But the state is not an all's old. As all this investment will benefit multiple generations, financing them via debt is the legitimate way to spread their costs among all the benefiting uh, generation. The Commission proposal is already a big improvement as it creates more incentive and leeway for quality investment and reform. But it maintains the arbitrary 3% deficit limit it remains, and it might meet 
make it impossible for some country to breach this funding gap, at least in the absence of common European fiscal capacity. So I will finish here. In the absence of debt sustainability risk, there is for us little rationale in applying arbitrary constraint to debt finance quality green investment and make the EU economy stronger, more resilient, and sustainable. They should therefore be excluded from deficit and expenditure limit to, because they improve long-term debt sustainability. Thank you. One question, because bless you, you had to really race at the end because there's too much to say, isn't yeah. there? In too little Wait time, much. like always, I think we are all aware of that being in Brussels. There is always too much to say in too short a time. However, very interesting. Just one question, picking up on what was said, if you caught it, because it was quite fast at the end. You talked there about the possibility of excluding some categories of spending, which I understand. Uh, but on the other hand, I guess you might get the question, you know, would it would some member states perhaps abuse this system you might get some kind of creative accounting there what how would one you know be careful to avoid that in a nutshell okay it's a very interesting uh, question indeed thank you um it's indeed we had discussion with different PEM rep different person in brussels commission the rest and this has been raised often in fact what you're asking is the quality of public finance the quality of investment how to ensure that if we give more leeway to member states it will be used to actually do the proper investment. But in fact, the solution is quite simple. What the Commission has done now is to replicate the logic of the RRF, to apply that to the fiscal rules to give more leeway to member states. And the process is basically member states propose a plan where with a country specific debt pathway, reform and investment. Then you have technical assessment by the Commission, a service criteria to analyze, and then a de political decision by the Council. The same thing could be applied to this question. You could have authorization for member states to submit a list of future oriented expenditure of green investment or whatever uh, to the commission that could check therefore if they comply with different important criteria like do no significant harm first the commission could do a debt sustainability analysis to be sure that the member states can afford to do that uh, you can have uh, ensuring that there is respect of the eu objective also in this investment and therefore the same way that for the rest of the plan um, if the Commission approve the plan with the quality investment exempté, then it's up to the Ecosin Council to decide and to say yes or no to the plan, including all this investment that has been ex excluded from the limit. And therefore, you avoid all this uh, mistake normally. And also, and something else that may come up, there is also this focus, I think, that we spoke about certainly before this event on the kind of quality rather than the quantity of investment. But I will park that there just for the moment, only because I need to allow all of these other good people to air their thoughts and then make sure that I leave time for the audience. But thank you so very much.